All right, so today I'm going to show you guys a bit of the network time protocol. So it'll be um, sort of a mix. I've got some slides uh, go over just the um, sort of the protocol in general. Uh, worth noting that NTP is not a specific program. Uh, it's a protocol, um, so you shouldn't think of it as, as specifically NTPD or any other implementation. Uh, it's an open protocol, and anybody can, can write um, a compliant program to uh, speak network time protocol. Uh, so a little bit of history. Uh, so the first network time protocol uh, developed, was developed in 1979, uh, demonstrated at the National Computer Conference, uh, later described in Internet Engineering Note 173, uh, and then later called the Internet Clock Service uh, in RFC 778. So that's pretty much the first mentions you'll find of um, time over the network um, on the Internet. Uh, soon after, uh, protocols called time and daytime. Uh, you probably still might see the daytime protocol out there, uh, and as well as the uh, Unix implementation called timed. Uh, then in 1985, uh, the first version of the NTP protocol, actually being called network time protocol, uh, released for both uh, Unix and the fuzzball routers, which were uh, DEX systems. Uh, and that was described in RFC 958. And then later on in 1988, uh, version 1 of NTP was released. And this is sort of the core set of protocol uh, that you're probably familiar with. Uh, it contains all of the um, network um, calculations that it uses to be able to synchronize time over the network. So sort of the beginning of modern NTP was uh, 1988 with version 1. Uh, so basic operation, uh, typically you'll run NTP in a uh, client-server uh, model where you have one, several servers um, serving time to many clients. Uh, but you can also run it in a peer-to-peer -peer model. Uh, you can have no master clock and you can simply have all of your servers agree on a time. It doesn't have to be the right time, they just all have to agree uh, what time they want to use. Uh, so it's able to use, it's able to run on diverse networks, uh, and it's able to achieve synchronization across them. So in order to synchronize a clock over a network, uh, you have to know a couple things about the behavior of the network you're on, uh, so you can take those into account. Uh, so you'll need to know your local clock offset from the server, or I'm going to say server, uh, but really it's it's the host that you're reaching out to. So I'm going to call it server from here on. Um, you'll need to know your offset from the remote clock that you're synchronizing to, and then you also need to know the round trip time uh, between you and the server, that way you can calculate um, how much you need to add to that time that you receive from the server based on how long it takes to get that time from the server. Uh, once the offset and round trip times are calculated by NTP, uh, it uses a statistical analysis formula to remove uh, outliers and anomalous values, uh, so you know, one packet might take an extra 100 milliseconds uh, and it knows to just ignore that. Don't, don't calculate to use that one specific packet because it's not going to be uh, the standard on all of the other packets that it receives. Uh, however, um, a weakness in, in that calculation is it's still assuming that the round trip time is equal between sending out the request for time and then getting that time back from the server. So when you say, uh, give me the time, and then the server replies back, okay, here's the time, and you record how long that takes, you're assuming that you can then divide that in two, and that's the time it took to get the reply back. But that's not always the case uh, if you've got an asymmetric route on the internet where it's taking longer, it's taking a long path out, and then it's taking a short path to get back in, or vice versa. Uh, you can end up with inaccuracy in that uh, because it's not properly calculating uh, the distance uh, from the server that it's getting time from. Uh, so there's a little diagram of, uh, there's the two formulas that it's using uh, for the offset in the round trip calculation. Basically it's just adding and subtracting uh, its time and the server's time that it stamps onto the packet um, and then it, it can calculate the proper time assuming everything's working right. And then there's a little diagram of the offset calculation. And you can see here how the, the two, the time there to get to the server and the time to get back are both equal. Uh, and that's where, if those were different sizes, uh, 
uh, then the formula gets thrown off and it, and it can't calculate things properly. So you'll hear the term uh, clock stratum in NTP, and clock stratum is uh, assigning a number from 0 to 15 to a clock to say logically how far it is from a reference clock. And a reference clock being a uh, atomic clock, typically uh, rubidium, cesium, uh, uh, isotopes inside those that it's using to um, keep very accurate time. Uh, so the first, the lowest stratum level is zero, and stratum zero is t technically theoretical because there is no NTP server that is actually stratum zero. Uh, it's specifically referring to that high precision atomic clock that's keeping time. Uh, with the atomic isotope. So stratum 1 is then a server that is directly connected to a reference clock. So you'll have a uh, computer that is directly connected to an atomic clock and that's typically receiving a pulse signal uh, every certain interval and the computer knows that every time it receives one of those uh, an exact number of, an uh, exact amount of time has passed. Uh, so typically, stratum one server uh, accurate to within a couple microseconds. Um, you'll also see stratum one servers being other than directly connected to an atomic clock. Uh, you'll see there's other ways of connecting to them. One of them is GPS. Uh, if you don't know, uh, the way GPS works is every GPS satellite has an atomic clock in it, and the only way that's the only way GPS works because they all every single GPS satellite has to have exactly the same time. So every GPS receiver also has exactly the right time because it has to be able to calculate the, the exact time between the GPS servers. So any GPS receiver is capable of getting essentially uh, perfect time from these uh, GPS satellites that are orbiting. Uh, you'll also find uh, reference time from cellular networks, same idea. Uh, every device on a cellular network is also sent out a time signal uh, to be so that all the radio transmitters are uh, synchronized. Adam looks like he wants to uh, interject. I, I do. Um, and this is something Jonathan and I are running into setting up the NPC Transmix. Uh, and the first thing to understand is although Stratum 1 servers are theoretically supposed to be directly connected to a reference clock source, i.e., atomic, CC. GPS is considered acceptable. There are a crap ton of servers out there claiming to be stratum one. Mm. They're actually connected to much, much lower quality time sources. Mm. And unfortunately, in Manitoba, cellular networks qualify as a much, much <laughs> lower quality time source. Uh, Rogers is accurate. Rogers is accurate to GSM within like a tenth of a second, which is Decent. It's not awesome, but it's decent. MTS is precisely one second off because they still haven't fixed the leap second from I think five years ago now, four years ago. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Because the only person at MTS who understood time got early retired out the door. So this, in my opinion, is one potential. <laughs> but uh, yeah, know that if you're using CDMA or GSM and picking an MPS tower, you are not getting high quality time today. <laughs> GPS is pretty good. Yeah. GSM, unfortunately, is often the closest thing you can get if you're inside a building. And, well, be careful which GSM. Okay, uh, so moving down the, the list of, or the scale of strata, uh, below, strata below stratum one, uh, we have stratum two, and each time we move down a stratum layer, we've essentially added one logical step between you and the reference clock um, that you're synchronized, that is being synchronized to. So a stratum two server is any server that's connected to one or more stratum one servers. Uh, and then 
logically beyond that, um, stratum 3 servers are any server that's connected to a stratum 2 server. And with each layer, um, you're adding a certain amount of inaccuracy uh, due to network conditions and server conditions and all of that. Uh, so as Adam mentioned, um, stratum, the stratum number, not a surefire way to know how accurate your clock is, uh, but it's usually a pretty safe bet to say that um, the lower the stratum number, the more accurate the clock is going to be. Uh, but there are certainly cases where that's not true. Um, so typically, uh, you'll have a stratum two. You'll several. You'll usually have several stratum two servers connected to stratum one servers, and those stratum two servers will serve time to many many clients. Um, most people aren't going to go through the trouble of setting up stratum one servers uh, just to serve clients. They're usually going to put put another layer of, of NTP servers between those stratum one servers and the actual clients that they want to synchronize. Uh, so usually stratum, usually stratum three and lower is just going to be clients. Uh, you won't see a ton of clocks uh, serving more time uh, at that stratum level. Uh, so here's a picture from Wikipedia of the uh, US Naval Observatory. Uh, that's their atomic clock. And there's uh, a lot of very fancy looking gear in there. The clock is part of that. Uh, so popular Im implementations of the NTP protocol, you've probably heard of one or more of these. Um, so NTPD is uh, maintained by the NTP Foundation and it's considered the reference implementation of the protocol. Um, as far as features go, uh, typically uh, the NTPD implementation is the uh, most thorough in all the features that it's including from the protocol. Uh, a new one, not a new protocol, or a new um, distribution, uh, but one that's probably more popular now is Crony, uh, which claims to be uh, faster and more accurate than NTPD. Um, you probably don't care, really. Uh, NTPD is pretty good. Didn't System D do their own Yeah, System D did. Okay. That I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just one comment I want to make about Crony. Yeah. Um, I don't know about the more accurate claim, but uh, one of the big advantages of Crony over NTPD is that it can work with intermittent network connections. Yes. NTPD assumes that you're constantly. Connected. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I pulled the, the claim of faster and more accurate, I pulled right from the Crony website. Uh, and right below that is also uh, the explanation that Crony D uh, is more resilient to um, adverse network conditions, uh, loss of connectivity, things like that. Um, so in a desktop environment, Crony is definitely advantageous uh, as far as keeping a clock up to sync more reliably. Um, don't know if you need that in a server that's Always, always connected to the network. Uh, however, that being said, Red Hat uh, has adopted, adopted uh, Crony as the standard NTP daemon for distribution as of RHEL 7, and I assume that's in CentOS and uh, Scientific as well, all the other enterprise Linux distributions. <laughs> yeah. So if you're booting up RHEL 7 and you're expecting to find NTPD, it's not there by default. Uh, you will find Crony. Uh, but NTPD is still fully supported and you can uh, switch back uh, if you'd like. Uh, also available is OpenNTPD. Uh, that's being developed by the OpenBSD Foundation, uh, specifically focused on security uh, at the expense, expense of speed and accuracy. Um, I've seen definitely some criticism online of people saying, oh, why would you bother using NTP OpenNTPD? It sucks, it's not accurate, and, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, yeah, we don't need nanosecond accuracy we need like millisecond accuracy and then we don't want to be in a ddos bot farm so which one are you going to pick um so if you ask theo de rat uh, he would say pick open ntpd um there's also been a lot of criticism from the openbsd team on the other implementations about very very massive not massive but very very common uh, vulnerabilities that allow lots of ddos potential 
So if you look at the, uh, the vulnerability log of NTPD, you'll notice most of them are DDoS patches. Um, so if you're worried about that, maybe consider open NTPD. Uh, they're certainly claiming to be more secure on that. Do you mean something like uh, if you log into a dubious uh, mirror, your times might not be what they should be? And no, public NTP servers that are exposed to the internet can be hijacked and used for DDoS purposes. Uh, question. Yeah, same idea. Very common to see reflection and amplification attacks uh, through NTP services. So definitely something to, to be aware of. Uh, so here's just some more expansion on the vulnerabilities that I was talking about. Um, number of vulnerabilities in the NTP daemon, um, especially ones that allow DDoS attacks. Um, especially prior to version 4.2.7 of NTPD, um, default configuration allowed, um, allowed for a DDoS attack to happen. It was, it was uh, default functionality. It wasn't even a bug. It was just somebody decided to use, use servers this way and it was able to perform DDoS attacks. Um, and now in 2015, there was also a vulnerability uh, in 4.2, before 4.2.9, um, that the message authentication uh, functionality was not implemented correctly. So it was, a man in the middle was able to present bogus time uh, to a server that was requesting time from server. Uh, so potential there for uh, abuse of specific, um, most widely TLS, uh, which relies on expiration dates of servers. So somebody could present you uh, bad time and then that client would not be able to properly validate uh, certificate expires. Um, server pools, these are uh, one of the things you'll find on the internet. Um, there is a public pool run by a partnership sort of with the NTP Foundation and NIST. Uh, and it's uh, basically a bunch of people who have gotten together and created a dynamic pool of NTP servers that are agreeing to list themselves publicly so that um, Anybody on the internet can use these free, uh, this free pool and be distributed to get uh, decent network time uh, from, these, from these servers. Uh, launched in 2003, uh, it provides public NTP for anybody who wants it. And currently there's over uh, 4,000 servers providing network time for free on the internet. Uh, and the Mug server is one of those. So if, you're, if you've got NTP, configured to use the pools, you might find that you are syncing from the mug server. Uh, so a demo. I'll show you guys just a quick demo of a couple, couple um, simple features. I'm not going to go very in depth, uh, but I do want to show you uh, sort of a client and then uh, a server on top of that. Uh, so I'm just going to reload my config. Oh, and one thing that always annoys me, I don't know if this bugs anybody else, but the NTP package is just called NTP, and all of the config files are just NTP, but the daemon is NTPD. So you get used to typing NTP, and then you go service NTP restart, it doesn't work. NTPD. Okay, so let's take a look at the, this is the default config file that comes with uh, NTPD. Really? You want colors off? Uh, blue. I can't read the blue. The blue is that the boss. I need closer. I'm having trouble. Uh, what's uh, color? SYN space off. I know, there's debate. Anyways, uh, I'll, I'll point out what's important. Um, so, 
there's not a lot there's not a lot that you that you need to worry about in the config file if all you want to do is run it in a basic scenario. Um, so the first things you'll see here are uh, two restrict statements, and then you'll see a couple more down here. And what these are doing is they're ACLs that are defining what access uh, other people on the network have to your daemon. Uh, NTP allows more than just time to be exchanged. It allows uh, remote administration, uh, and it allows a lot of diagnostic information to be read potentially by other clients. And this is where that uh, DDoS attack originally came from. Uh, the default options on these restrict statements for the internet, see how the restrict default, uh, did not include uh, at the very end there the no query option. And what that was allowing was uh, the when you query, you can query the server details of the NTP server and it will reply with a ton of data about who it's syncing from and the sync status and all of those details. So you can send this very small request uh, to the server and it'll spit out this big packet of data. And because it's running on UDP, uh, you can spoof your source address and you can get that NTP server to throw this big packet of data at anybody you choose. So that was fixed and now the default is basically the server won't give you anything except the time. Uh, you can also even restrict that. You can say uh, you can add in um, the no server option and it won't give you anything. It just won't reply. Uh, and then further down, we're allowing uh, the local host full access to the daemon. So it's anything you want to do to NTP locally, you're allowed to do. Uh, and then there's a, an example here, uh, basically of how you would allow um, more open access to uh, a local subnet. And then here, this is the default uh, server directives that are included with uh, the CentOS package. And so you can see here, um, the, the URLs here are pool.ntp.org. So by default, this client is going to try and talk to uh, the NTP pool that I just talked about. And specifically, it's accessing the uh, CentOS portion of it. And the NTP pool does that to track who's sending them traffic. So it, it's the same pool, whether it's a CentOS or Red Hat or whatever um, distribution you're using is probably going to have a different name as that, um, that first domain there. But it's still hitting the same pool of servers. They're just using that to track who's coming where. And then there's also geographic uh, options as well that you can use. And then uh, at the end of that, you'll see iBurst, which is a, a burst synchronization option. And that allows it to rapidly send multiple sync requests in order to more quickly uh, ascertain the time from the server it's using uh, at the expense of a higher load. So if, you, if you're syncing to one specific server and that server has asked you, you know, please don't spam me with requests, you would turn that off. You just let it synchronize more slowly. Uh, that way you don't uh, inundate the, the server with more traffic than you should be. And that's, that's all you'll find for uh, configuration options that you might want to use by default. Uh, and then the rest of it, uh, you can get into um, key authentication. You can have servers that um, will only serve time to other servers with, uh, with a public key. And you can also have it authenticating uh, servers knowing their key. So I didn't actually change that default file at all. Uh, you shouldn't need to, you should just be able to start NTP and your server or your, your client will then synchronize time to that pool, assuming you have internet access. So we can check our uh, NTP status, uh, first with the very simple command, NTP stat, and that will simply tell you if you're synchronized or not. And it will say, uh, yes, you are synchronized to NTP. Uh, and it'll tell you who you're synchronized to, and then, You'll see this uh, time correct to within 581. This is basically a worst case scenario. Um, you'll see, there's another command I'm gonna show you and you'll see that uh, this time correct to is much different than what it's actually considered accurate to. Uh, and NTP stat is specifically giving you like a worst case scenario where you're guaranteed to be more accurate than, than that value. So we're guaranteed to be more accurate that within 581 milliseconds of accuracy uh, to the to the correct time 
And then you can see it's pulling the server every 256 seconds. And this will actually increase as it becomes more synchronized. Um, if you keep your pull time too short, um, this is actually described in good detail on the ntp.org site, is uh, you'll, end up, you'll end up doing this and you won't be able to lock on to a synchronized time. Uh, you end up going back and forth chasing uh, this synchronized time because you can't, you can't match the drift of your local clock. So you end up just going back and forth, back and forth, uh, overcompensating for the drift of your local clock. So as you get more accurate, you'll see this will go up to um, like 10 minutes and it won't, won't check for time uh, because it knows it's not going to, it knows how much it's going to drift. So it can compensate for that locally. Uh, so the other command I'll show you is uh, ntpq, which is ntp query. And this is what allows you to basically run the full suite of commands against uh, an ntp daemon that you would want. And here we're going to tell it just to print uh, the print the basic info of the server that we're talking to. And by default, it's going to talk to localhost. So you can specify a remote server if that server has allowed you to query it. And by default, as you saw, it's, it's not going to let you. Only localhost can actually query these details from the daemon. So if we take a look at our what our local daemon is doing, this is a, a description of the servers that it's synchronized to and details about those servers. So here are the, so you saw we had four servers listed in the config file, and each one of those DNS names has then been translated to an actual host from the pool. Uh, you can list, you can list up to, I think, 10 servers, 10 or more servers in your config file, and it'll, it'll check all of them, and it'll pick, uh, it'll pick the best one. You'll see there's a uh, asterisk beside uh, one of them, and that's the one we're actually synchronizing to. That's the one we're, we're considering the best clock to use, and then, uh, the plus symbols are servers that are considered uh, to be very close to our primary server, uh, so we're going to keep checking them as well. Uh, next, the reference ID field is showing us where this clock is getting its time. And so you can see that uh, a couple of these are listing IP addresses. In this case, um, this same server is getting, uh, both servers are getting time from the same reference, and then these two you'll notice say PPS, and PPS is pulse per second. So in that case, we can assume that these are actually connected to um, a reference clock that's feeding them a pulse time signal instead of an NTP signal. So at this point, they're not synchronizing to an NTP clock, they're synchronizing to a reference clock that's providing them uh, an accurate pulse signal directly. And then you can check uh, the stratum of each server, and you can see that these two with the PPS are listed at stratum 1, which matches what we would assume, that servers that are directly connected to that reference clock are going to be stratum 1, and these two servers that are connected to another remote server are going to be stratum 2. Uh, and moving down, uh, the other two we're looking at are the delay, that's how long it took uh, to get traffic, or to get a reply from the server, and then the offset is our clock's difference from this clock. So you can see these are not all the same. So these, all of these clocks are not exactly in sync <coughs> compared to our clock. Uh, but you will notice that the two stratum 1 servers are very, very close. Uh, so minus, like I said, that little bit of uh, inaccuracy in the network calculation is where, where some of the inaccuracy will come from calculating these offset values. Is that milliseconds? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And then jitter is also in milliseconds, and this is the variation that we're finding in reply traffic from that server. Uh, so this is another big indicator of, of quality, not of the server, but of your connection to that server. Uh, and you'll you see here, the one with the biggest offset also has the biggest jitter, uh, which is a sign of um, mm -hmm. network congestion or unreliable connection to that server. Uh, so you'll see there's sort of correlation here between good values and bad values, and they all sort of add up together. Uh, so if we want to, uh, now if we don't want to use these pool servers, uh, all we have to do is repoint them at a different server. 
And we can synchronize, if we want, we can synchronize to uh, a single server. So if we get rid of all these, and we just replace this one to be Well, yeah, I'll, I'll explain further. Um, so now if we check, um, if we query our local host and we see, um, just let it refresh again. So the offset is negative because we're ahead of the clock, the clock we are uh, querying. Um, so the reason it's including uh, time1.mx.ca in there is because that's what the monk server is talking to. But you'll see the, the asterisk here as I scroll that up. So the asterisk here is on uh, mug.ca. So that's the server we're actually synchronizing with. Uh, and then this is, uh, this is included uh, in there, sort of as a secondary. And then same here, you'll see, uh, you see we're quite off sync mug.ca, uh, and this will, this will change as we get more accurate, um, and the same with the, the jitter. Where's this VM? Uh, this is on my local machine. And you're on, oh, you're on a cell network, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of, you don't use connected through MRS, but MX, so Yeah, not, not well, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not very good. Uh, but like, I, so you can sync to a single server, uh, but the problem there is you have no sanity check. So you really, that one server can go wild and it can start drifting and doing whatever, but you have no way to tell, you have no sanity check to say, oh, well, that doesn't, that server doesn't look right. You know, it's, it's changed a bunch, uh, but the rest of these servers say something different. And so for best case uh, of time, you want multiple servers in there that you can compare to and it'll, it'll aggregate them together and it'll decide what the most sane value is based on the data that they report to it. I think I saw it recommended somewhere you either have one or four or one. Um, I haven't seen that specifically, but that, that doesn't the surprise idea me. Is that if you have two places that tell you the different time, which one's correct, who knows? Yes, that's, yeah, that's a good so, point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's all relative to how robust you want your time to be. Yeah. Um, that's another thing. If you if you read some of the yeah, if you read some of the documentation, um, they'll talk about uh, robustness and how critical it is time to you. Uh, and you might say, oh, I don't really care as long as it says reasonably the right time. Then you probably don't care. You just uh, add one server. You add the pool servers, and that's good enough uh, for you. Or you might take time very seriously. Uh, if you're synchronizing logs across uh, multiple data centers and locations and aggregating them, uh, then it's more important to have those be very, very close to in sync as possible. And that's where you want to start looking at uh, distributed, distributing your clocks uh, and making sure that everything is uh, robust. Um, so just like uh, the client config, you can run it just with the default. You can also run it uh, as a server with the default config. Um, some people might not be a fan of it, but um, the default config does run uh, the NTP daemon as a server. Uh, so anywhere, any network that the, that the server is accessible to can query that NTP server for its time. Uh, it might not be a good time, but you can query that server for it. Uh, so here I've got um, another virtual machine, um, same thing. I will uh, switch the config back to original. And it was one. So if we look through this config file, um, there's nothing different. It's, it's just running the default config. 
But if we go back to our client here and we edit which server it wants to talk to, we can simply replace this with uh, 112 to 132. That's what that's red. And now you can see that uh, this client is now talking to uh, another local server. So we didn't have to do any config on that other server to make it a NTP server. It will just give time to anybody who asks for it and, and it's getting that time from whatever servers it's configured to, uh, to use. So now if we wanna actually use a server in a more robust scenario where we do actually want multiple servers that are all gonna keep the same time, uh, then we would um, get a little more complicated with our config. And so I'll switch to that one. So if we take a look at this config, and I'm gonna leave the comments blue because we don't need them. Uh, you'll see the only thing Two things we've changed. Uh, so here I've set a server specifically to use uh, NTP servers that I know are good. Uh, so these are the NTP servers at the Toronto Internet Exchange, uh, and I know they're Stratum 1 servers, so I'm going to choose to use uh, three of them. And then below that, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to list all of the other servers that I want my network, that I want in my NTP cluster. So all of these peers are going to talk to each other and they're going to compare what time they have. And they're all going to make sure that they agree on what time it is. Because they should all be telling the exact same time to anybody who's querying them. So here I've just got one other peer. Uh, that's the, uh, the other server that I have running. And then they're going to talk to each other and they're going to agree, agree on time. So I'll just restart this. And then if I show you this config, the only difference here is now we're using different Stratum 1 clocks. So these are clocks from Hurricane Electric, uh, also Stratum 1. And then here our peer is the other server. So they're both listing the other server as peers, and then they're going to talk to each other and agree on the time. If you're looking for uh, something like this, um, good Stratum 1 servers. Um, you can just Google um, public Stratum 1 servers, uh, and there's, there's some out there for sure. Um, commonplace is internet exchanges. Um, Manitoba Internet Exchange has some good NTP clocks, although they're not technically Stratum 1. Um, Adam could go into more detail about that. Um, and then the Toronto Internet Exchange, like I listed earlier, is also Stratum 1, uh, so common to find public uh, Stratum 1 servers at internet exchanges. And then Hurricane Electric is a big uh, tier one internet provider that also runs public NTP servers for people. So we've got two different servers uh, synchronizing their time from two different sources. So here we're getting lots of variety in our time. That way we can, we can come up with um, a very agreeable time between all of the different sources that we're using. That way any specific uh, network lag that affects time from one server uh, is not going to affect all of the servers because they're all pulling from the same spot over the same network path. Uh, we want it to be diverse. That way we can uh, get the best aggregate value. So why, if, if you have two peers um, with different clock times and also different clock times from the lower strata, yeah. um, how does it decide what the common time is going to be? Uh, I think at its base, it just comes down to a majority. Um, well, if you have an even number of servers, uh, I don't know how they resolve uh, the conflict. They don't send their stats to each other and compare their stats? They do, they do compare stats, uh, and that's so like, they likely they pick, they pick whatever the server tells them is best. But if, yeah, but if both servers think they have better time, uh, then you can run into to an issue. Uh, so that's where Kevin's comment of, of running more than two um, is a good idea. We can restrict, you know, 
appear option that's within your config file can still have a configuration? There is. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't affect local networks, and I'm not sure why that behavior is there. But, but yes, uh, the no peer stops internet hosts from peering with you so that people can't peer with you and then mess up your time on your server. Uh, uh, so so that's restricted. This, but I recall that they, they look at the statistics, they look at the jitter and the drift and you know delay times, and from that they figure out, uh, you know, they use that as well as um, you know, every, everything that you're sampling. Yeah, it's all an aggregate, and they they pick yeah they pick the best. That's what they used to do. Yeah. If you're really curious, you can go read the RFC documents that that describe the protocol and, and how it does that. It's been a long time because I remember uh, using stuff like Tick and Talk. I don't know if you guys well, those still those still exist. They're still available. Um, I don't think they are. I don't think they're open to query. So now if we, so we've got these two uh, servers running uh, and they are configured to peer with each other. Uh, if we query them to take a look at their status. <laughs> Apparently Hurricane Electric considers CDMA in, in San Jose, Fremont, and New York City to be So you can see uh, for these three hurricane electric clocks, uh, you can see the, the delay is actually quite different between all of them. And that's because we're going to three geographically diverse locations. So the network time uh, is different between those. Um, that also provides very good network diversity in terms of uh, jitter. Uh, so if, if one specific server uh, is ending up asymmetric or wrong, then we've still got two other servers that are hopefully providing better uh, network performance. So onto the peering, you'll notice here it lists uh, our peer as one of the servers that it's synchronizing to. And it's uh, so 192.168.132 uh, is the other server, that's server one in that we're peer to. And if we go on server one, it'll be the opposite. If we if we look here. That's normal. That's perfectly normal. Yeah. Yeah. So here you'll see it lists uh, 133 as as a clock, and you'll notice under the offset, they both say, uh, oh no, see this one is off. It's probably synchronized by now. Nope. So the idea is so it here. Will to zero. Yes, the idea is it will converge to zero. But you can tell by this that I think what's happened is it's picked uh, server one as the master peer because server one is saying, or no, sorry, the other way around. Server two is the master because server one thinks that the offset of, its offset from, from server two is zero. So it thinks they're, it thinks they're perfectly in sync um, for some reason, uh, server two does not agree, which is odd. But at some point, they should both converge to zero, where they agree 100% with each other, um, taking into account, yes? Your reach is zero, it hasn't fully synchronized yet, it hasn't finished the server yet. Ah, yes, that's why. There we go. Nope. Let's check here. This is what. So this server doesn't consider itself synchronized yet. And so depending on uh, depending on the quality of data that it's getting back from its clocks, it can take longer or shorter for it to consider itself uh, synchronized. So I'll wait for those to synchronize, 
And while that's happening, I will show you one quick thing uh, back on the client, and that is uh, those ACLs. Uh, so here's a sort of a sample of restricting access, or at, rather, uh, granting access. Uh, so if we look below these two default restrictions, I've placed a restrict statement for my local uh, VMware network. And then we specify uh, the subnet mask that we want to use. So we can restrict this to a specific host, uh, like we do here, and then there's no mask necessary. Or we can open it up uh, to a specific network and we def define the mask there. And then here we define specific uh, options for the server. And these are uh, available in the documentation, what each one does. Uh, and there's more than just You'll see there's uh, five of them listed here, uh, but there's more, more of them than that, and you can sort of get a little more fine grained on what you want to allow or disallow. And so the difference is here, I've gotten rid of this no query option. And as if you'll recall, that's the option that was uh, responsible for uh, DDoS vulnerability. But locally, we might want to allow that so that we can check the status of all of our NTP servers from remote hosts without actually having to log into the box uh, and check its NTP status locally. So I will load that in. Actually, before I do that, I will just show you here. So if we try to query that server, that uh, client server, and we try and get the status of it, so here we can just type in which server we want to query, and that'll be 131. Uh, it's just not going to answer. It's just going to give us a timeout uh, on NTP. The NTP daemon totally ignores the request. Uh, so if we then load that configuration file, and now we try querying it again, we can see that now that client will tell us uh, local on the network uh, who it's actually connected to uh, and the values that it's getting from those servers. So that's useful if you want to make sure that all of your servers are in fact getting good time and see what the status of it is. Okay, so let's see if this is synchronized. That one's good. This one is still not synchronized. I could, yeah. Oh, another thing I'll talk about uh, while this synchronizes is um, you'll notice I'm creating my servers uh, on virtual machines here. Um, never, never do that. Uh, if you want to run time servers, don't run them on a VM. Because if you know how virtualization works, uh, basically that CPU, that CPU that the virtual machine has that's supposed to be running at 2.33 or 2. whatever gigahertz per second actually doesn't do that. It actually the, the clock cycles of the OS don't always actually run at the exact frequency that, the, that you'd expect it to. And so when the OS thinks, oh, one minute is so-and-so many uh, CPU cycles, uh, and that many CPU cycles doesn't actually happen in a minute, uh, then the time just drifts way out because even though the server thinks, yeah, I'm keeping really good time, uh, the underlying CPU is not actually running the way it thinks. Uh, so, even really, really cheap physical hardware is better than virtual hardware. Um, so a good example is a Raspberry Pi. Even though Raspberry Pi doesn't even have its own real clock in it, it does have a real CPU that runs at the exact same clock frequency no matter what. So a Raspberry Pi will keep better time than a virtual server. So if you want a basic NTP cluster, get a couple of Pis, Peer them together, um, and then you're you're not bad off. So what should you do to try to keep your clock reasonably accurate on a virtual server? Just set it up as a client? Yeah, just set it up as a client. Uh, NTP will do a decent job. Um, it doesn't do a great job. You're still going to see, um, like the best I see at work uh, from NTP stat giving you the worst case is about 100 milliseconds. So it's not bad, but it's it by no means precise. 
Question? So that's that's a contrast to say running uh, an entity daemon just on the hypervisor and expecting the hypervisor to take care, care of everything and be in touch with the guests if there's any kind of integration. Right. If your if your host supports pushing that clock through uh, to the virtual hosts, uh, which VMware does and KVM and all of them do, uh, then yes, if your if your hypervisor is keeping good time, um, then I'm not sure what limitations there are of that time pass through, but I presume it's pretty good, uh, keeping keeping all of its uh, hosts uh, accurate. Okay. Conversely, though, if you have a guest OS that maybe doesn't have that level of integration and you want to keep good time in there. Then yes, run an NTP daemon. You're yeah. saying, but don't um, don't have others rely on that NTP right. daemon. Right. Period. Yeah. It's just be an endpoint. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So both of our clocks are in sync now. Uh, so hopefully this looks right. And to the offset. Okay, so these look very, very close. They're not in agreement yet, or one is, actually no, they're, they're far off still. But they're getting closer. One is, neither of them is seeing zero now. What is the reach number? The reach, I believe, is a uh, measure of network distance uh, between the two. Um, yeah, I'd have to read up on that a little more. I'm not sure the exact terminology it's using how the numbers work exactly. So that's all I have to show you. Uh, any more questions? No? All right, thanks guys.